Well, thank you so much for being here. As I said last week, it's always a joy for me to be at my home church. Uh, there is a special warmth and welcome when I go forth from this place. The time that we spend together here as a church family really does sustain me as I encounter uh, large auditoriums and lots of strangers and new places. So thank you for being here and thank you for the, all of the ways that you speak into my life and also into my ministry. We're in the second of a two-part series entitled Life Lessons from C.S. Lewis. Last week we looked at C.S. Lewis's faith journey and we looked at a number of aspects of that faith journey. This week we're going to look more specifically at the way he lived out his faith. Um, I've had a long day today because I needed to be at the airport at LAX at 6 o'clock this morning. Now to get to LAX at 6, in the, well you can do the math, you can, <laughs> you can figure out how uh, that's happened. I feel like I've already had a very, very long day. What I was doing was dropping off my daughter at the airport where she and the rest of her 8th grade class are leaving, oh probably right about now, on an airplane to go to Washington DC. Now I understand this is a sort of rite of passage for middle schoolers. Uh, wasn't so back in my day, but for her, this is a great big deal. I don't know about you, but it makes me a little scary to think about my little girl going completely across the country and being entrusted to the care of a lot of other people, many of whom I don't know. I think about that and it terrifies me, but it also feels like a privilege that we live in a day where it's possible for her to travel this way. What a remarkable privilege for her to see the great places associated with our country. Uh, they will uh, travel through museums and monuments. She's been studying hard the last two months to learn more about what it means to be a part of this country. And I think it is scary, but it's also a privilege. It is intense, though, and I'm glad that before I launched her off into this adventure, we had time to pray and to share. The life lessons of C.S. Lewis are practical lessons for people like us who have very busy schedules, who have to get up at very, very early hours, who have to manage a lot of different aspects of our daily life. And I'm excited to share with you today a little bit about Lewis's own spiritual practice the daily uh, characteristics or qualities that made it possible for him to uh, do the work that he did. As we look at these ideas, will you uh, pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, um, sometimes I forget to be grateful because a lot of the things that you're calling me to just feel hard or scary or overwhelming or tiring. And I'm sorry for that. I pray that I would have the ability to approach more of what you have for me as an adventure. To say boldly, no, this is the day the Lord has made. Not the day that I want it to be, but the day that it actually is. The way it actually turned out. This is what Lord, the Lord has made. This is the day the Lord has made. The day of your choosing, Lord. The adventure that you laid out for me. God, I want today in every way to be thoroughly converted, to be thoroughly yours, to be wholly used in whatever way you find useful, to submit my agendas and my plans to yours, to hide in the shadow of your wings in those places where I'm timid or afraid. God, I pray that you would bless us this morning that you would lead us in our conversation together and that we would learn a little more about what it means to journey with you in this great journey of faith. I ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord of all. Amen. 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 So thank you. So last week we looked at Lewis's faith journey and I suggested to you that there are several big lessons that we learn from looking at that journey. The first thing I talked about was the idea of a mother's prayer and the importance of his mom's prayers for him at an early stage. Lewis's faith journey was not smooth. 
It was not easy. It was not seamless. It was not without some pretty significant bumps in the road. How did he negotiate all that? I argued last week that it was the prayer of his mom from the earliest stage, the prayers that we pray as moms, dads, grandparents, the prayers that we pray as friends and neighbors, the ways that we encounter even those small little moments, whether in a grocery store or over at the Starbucks, those simple opportunities that we have to do what back in my day we called arrow prayers. Do they still teach arrow prayers? Where just like an arrow and a bow, you just let fly a short prayer of blessing to that car that cut you off on the 210, or that person in the third row who's not paying attention, or whatever else it is that's going on in your day. Have you had the experience of just walking down the sidewalk and seeing someone and thinking, that guy needs prayer? Now, what I usually do after that, I think, somebody ought to pray for him, <laughs> right, right? And then I think, oh, maybe I should pray for him, like, now. And, it, you know, so you, you, I'm kind of slow. You're, you're much faster than I am. You saw that one coming. But just the idea that we can, throughout our day, pray, and that prayer makes a difference. Prayer, especially the faithful prayer of those that we live with and we are around on an ongoing basis. I believe that we are here today talking about C.S. Lewis because Flora Hamilton Lewis prayed for her son, Clive. I think that's why all of the rest of it unfolded. Number two, we talked about in Lewis's faith journey, journey that sometimes the road is hard. And I shared with you last week that I used to have this idea that famous people like C.S. Lewis knew they were famous people like C.S. Lewis. They kind of grew up in a special place. Maybe they were raised on a mountaintop or something. Maybe they were fed a special food. I don't, I don't know, kind of like queen bees, you know. I shared with you last week that idea that for Lewis, the road was very hard sometimes. He struggled with doubt. He struggled with depression. He struggled a lot with loss, with death, with disappointment. And that was part of his journey, too. And God was faithful through all that. But the fact that he had hard times gives me hope. Because I don't know about you, I have hard times, too. And it helps me a lot to know that that's OK, that the hard times in life don't disqualify us from being used by God in amazing and remarkable ways. How cool is that? Last week, uh, number three, we looked at the importance of friends in terms of our spiritual journey. Lewis said that Tolkien and Dyson were the immediate human causes of his conversion to Christ. The books he read, the company he kept, the people who spoke into his life made a big, big difference. For Lewis, the journey of faith is a companioned journey. Praise God. <laughs> we don't go through this alone. Praise God for the companioned journey. Sometimes I think if I made one big change in my life, it would be this, to spend more time reaching out to the companions on my journey. Because I get busy, really busy sometimes. It's hard. And I don't make a phone call or send a text or get together for coffee as often as I ought to. And to do that more often means that I would be blessed, but so might others, if I were a little bit more thoughtful in remembering that God's not taking me through this journey alone, and he intends for me to be companioned. We need to take time and devote ourselves to one another. That's a lesson that we talked about last week. And one more. Lewis had a goal as a Christian. You might call it a mission statement. Talk about that a lot in business settings, but what about in terms of our faith? What's our goal as believers? To use Glenn Kirk's language, our goal is to become fully committed followers. Fully committed followers. So that there's no aspect of our life, no department in our thinking, no area of our home or our schedule or our finances that isn't ultimately open to what God might want to do. Remember Walter Hooper's statement that C.S. Lewis was the most thoroughly converted man he ever met. 
And you think about what would that be like to live in such a way that our goal, our destination is that by next year, we are more fully converted, fully devoted, fully given over to the things that God wants to do, open and available to whatever it is God has in mind, which often is quite different to our own ways of thinking. So that was last week. And this week what I want to do is I want to tell some stories and give you some examples of how Lewis lived out his faith once he came to faith. Now he has been a giant influence on a lot of people. So what were the components that made the biggest difference in his life? There are so many things we could talk about, and I'm just going to talk about three. Three things that characterized Lewis's daily life and that I believe formed his character and made it possible for him to become the author and teacher and speaker and husband that he was. So here's the first one, and it will surprise you. I have been studying C.S. Lewis for a very, very long time. And there is no single fact about C.S. Lewis that surprises me and delights me more than this one thing. C.S. Lewis answered all his mail. <laughs> C.S. Lewis answered all his mail. I don't answer all. I'm <laughs> C.S. Lewis made a commitment to sit down in the dewy, cobwebby, cobwebby early hours of the day. That's his phrase, dewy, cobwebby early hours of each day. His favorite time of day. What do you like to do during your favorite time of day? What C.S. Lewis did during his favorite time of day is devoted himself selflessly to a task he hated because C.S. Lewis hated to write letters. He hated it. He said that Christmas would be a really good holiday, but, but all the mail, all the cards, he couldn't stand it. Now here's a man who disliked Christmas because he started getting too much mail. He didn't like writing letters. He didn't like getting mail. But he felt that he was called by God to do something with the position, what we would call the platform, that God had given him. God had given him a certain amount of fame, and he felt that that wasn't for his own sake. It was for the sake of others. So he would get up early, early, early in the morning. He would make his toast, and he would drink his tea. And he would take out sheet after of paper after sheet of paper and the pile of letters that had come the day before. And with prayer and great care, he would answer each one. Because he thought, perhaps I will have the privilege of doing some good with this simple act. Now, there's probably some of you here who are retired and you think, how can I do great things for God? I can't get around as fast as I used to. I can't work as hard as I once was. I don't even have a job that gets me out and about. C.S. Lewis found that the simple ministry of writing letters, reaching out and encouraging people, pen and paper, stamps and envelopes, was one of the major ministries that he indulged in. Now, for Lewis, that meant that eventually we would have three giant books <laughs> of his collected letters. Thousands and thousands and thousands of them that are still delightful to read. If I were on a desert island and I could only bring one book by C.S. Lewis, I'd bring his collected letters. I would, because there's so much in there. It's so nourishing. I think that would be really, really wonderful. So Lewis said that the mail was what he called the bane of my life. And yet he was faithful in the mundane. Now, God has a sense of humor, you know? Have you noticed that? God has a sense of humor. A very, very small aside, Lewis hated writing letters, but he wrote letters as an act of obedience. Do you ever do things out of obedience? That clenching of your teeth, God, I don't want to do this, but I will because you're telling me to? Eventually, after many, many years, C.S. Lewis met his wife, Joy Davidman, 
because she wrote him a letter and he was already in the habit of answering those letters thoughtfully and their correspondence grew into a deep, deep friendship, eventually a romance, and they lived happily ever after. Isn't that funny? That the thing that Lewis hated, that he did out of obedience, became the door that God uses to the, used to the greatest blessing of his life. How cool is that? Isn't that like God? When we do what we're asked to, the very best we know how, for God to turn that for our good with blessing. Here's the second thing about Lewis's walk of faith, his faith journey, his daily practice. Lewis was brutally honest with God. He was brutally honest with God. Lewis said that there is a prayer that we should pray before all other prayers, and I love this. And if you will start doing this, it'll change everything about the way you and God hang out. The prayer before all prayers goes like this. Lord, may it be the real I who speaks. Lord, may it be the real thou that I speak to. Lord, may it be the real I who speaks. Lewis said we should bring to God what is in us, not what ought to be in us. Anybody here guilty of bringing what ought to be in us to the Lord instead of what's actually in us? May it be the real I who speaks is the first part of this prayer that goes before all prayers. May I be who I actually am, not who I want to be. May I bring to you how I really feel, not how I think I'm supposed to feel. May I bring to you what I'm actually struggling with, not what I think you're going to tell me about whatever, may it be the real I, down to the bone, the real, real, real me. And then the second part of that is, may it be the real thou that I speak to. Lewis was committed to making sure that he wasn't talking to his idea about God. I, um, in my, in my own faith journey, have been very instructed by the teachings of Francis Schaeffer. Do some of you know his work and teaching? Francis Schaeffer used to say, God is there, and he is not silent. Lewis believed the same thing. There's an actual, God, God is actually there. We don't pray to or interact with our ideas about God. We don't commit ourselves to our ideas about God, but to the actual God, the one who's really there and is not silent. Lewis believed it was a lifelong process of getting to the place where we were actually talking to God and not our ideas of God, our fears about God, our wishes about God, our thoughts about God, or our theologies, but the real God who's actually there, who's really there and not silent. May it be the real I who speaks. May it be the real thou that I speak to. Um, Lewis often paced back and forth as he prayed. Any other of you peripatetic prayers? You walk. He would walk back and forth. Lewis spent about an hour uh, a day in prayer. And he often read scripture. He would read a short passage and then he would pray based on that. He would use that as sort of a springboard to the thing that he wanted to pray for. I don't know about your prayer life. I don't know how it's going. But maybe praying in a peripatetic way, walking back and forth might free up your ability to talk to the real God who's really there and would love to hear from you. Maybe praying scripture will help us get out of the ruts that we get into sometimes. Lewis loved the Psalms and often prayed using them as well. He found the best time for prayers to be at nighttime, in the evening, and after the day was done. And so that's when he would tend to, to, to have his prayer time. I think that varies a lot. Um, there are so many other things that we could mention about Lewis's daily practice. I'm just going to mention one more. Lewis listened to the still, small voice of the Spirit. This was his practice. We think about prayer as speaking. He saw prayer as listening. And he tried in his daily walk 
in the course of his daily life, literally to be attentive to the way that the Spirit might direct him. Now, this is kind of important for us to get a handle on because when you think about Lewis, I don't know what image comes to your mind. Do you think about Anthony Hopkins? Have some of you seen the movie Shadowlands? <laughs> is that who you picture? Anthony Hopkins was a great actor, is a great actor, but he's not a great C.S. Lewis. Because C.S. Lewis was a big, cheerful, um, beefy, red-faced man with a merry sense of humor and a gift for friendship. That doesn't sound like Anthony Hopkins at all. <laughs> Let me read to you a description of C.S. Lewis uh, from one of his students. His students reported that when Lewis walked into a classroom, he looked more like a butcher or another tradesman than an intellectual. He was broad of face and ruddy of complexion. His large head gave the impression of plumpness, although full-length pictures show rather a sturdy and compact build. He was simply big, large of fist and broad of frame. Lecturing on the medieval belief in planetary influences, he would often say with a twinkle, quote, the jovial character is cheerful and festive. Those born under Jupiter are apt to be loud-voiced and red-faced. And it is obvious that that's the planet under which I was born. <laughs> I do not know what heavenly influence can be blamed for his carelessness in dress, however. Lewis chafed under the necessary routines of life, such as shopping. Lewis's brother reported that he had a talent for making a new suit look shabby the second time he wore it. In a letter, Lewis himself tells of starting out into town one day and discovering that he had on shoes that did not match. One was clean and the other was dirty. Having no time to return home and finding that the dirty shoe was impossible to clean, he, de <laughs> he decided to make the clean shoe dirty. <laughs> I love that. So you have to imagine Lewis, this very large sort of, you know, well, he dressed like a college professor, kind of, you know, big, um, uh, jovial character with a merry sense of humor uh, and, and dressed in maybe a little shabby way. But here is a man who, despite all of his bluster, and his size and his strength, who was very, very sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to what Scripture calls that still small voice of the Spirit. I want to read you one of my favorite stories about C.S. Lewis. Lewis wrote an essay called The Efficacy of Prayer, and it's in this collection called The World's Last Night. The Efficacy of Prayer. Does prayer make a difference? And Lewis opens this essay with this story. So this is Lewis himself describing it. Some years ago, I got up one morning intending to have my hair cut in preparation for a visit to London. And the first letter I opened that morning made it clear I did not need to go to London. So I decided to put off my hair cut too. <laughs> but then there began the most unaccountable little nagging in my mind almost like a voice saying, get it cut all the same. Go, get it cut. In the end, I could stand it no longer. I went. Now, my barber at that time was a fellow Christian and a man of many troubles whom my brother and I had sometimes been able to help. The moment I opened his shop door, he said, oh, I was praying you might come today. And in fact, if I had come a day or so later, I would have been no use to him. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool, that small gut feeling, that little tiny sense that maybe we should do something even though it may not necessarily make sense on our agenda, on our list. So many times, I look at my to-do list and something just sort of 
pops out that doesn't seem timely to me or particularly significant or important. And it's interesting to me that when I obey that prompting, there's so much blessing involved in that. Have you found that to be the case? I bet we could go around the room and I bet people would have stories. A visit that you made, a phone call that you made, or the timing of a particular thing that you thought was supposed to be over here and all of a sudden this was the appointed moment. And because you listened and obeyed, even though it didn't make sense, God was able to move in ways that were unexpected, far beyond anything we know how to ask or think. That's the kind of life that Lewis led. A life of that kind of listening, of listening to wherever God might take him. So those things, when we think about Lewis, you know, I, I, wanted, I wanted to look at the big flashy things, big, gigantic, crazy secrets, you know. Isn't this very ordinary stuff? Isn't this the ordinary stuff that any of us can do? To answer our mail, right? To be attentive to the voice of the Spirit and to grow much deeper in our willingness to be who we really are before God and one another and to talk with God who's really there. Let's pray. Let's talk to him now. God, I've been so blessed by the ministry of your servant, C.S. Lewis. I've been encouraged by his books. I've been enlightened by his wisdom. But to be honest, I've also been really challenged by his example. As someone who did extraordinary things because he lived a very ordinary life of prayer and obedience. I want to be more like that. God, help us. Even now, Holy Spirit, come and whisper to our hearts those things that you would have us to do to conform us more to the image of Jesus and cause us to walk out our salvation, our faith, in ways that we can truly become difference makers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you so much.